from digital marketing to uh, graphics design to blockchain to machine learning, 3D printing, and so on. Our focus in the last six months have been on tech skills for Industry 4.0 and beyond. We're very proud of all the work we have done. We hope that during these times that we have been able to bless you, we have been able to contribute one or two things and some of the skills you've learned. We hope that you utilize this to advance your career. We hope that you use them to also um, maybe start something new, maybe start a business. There are so many different opportunities that COVID-19 and remote work has presented. We hope that as people are nest these opportunities, that you will be one of those that we can point at to, to other people who have utilized the opportunities presented to us. All right, I would like to introduce you to STEM Hub Foundation and Uchi would later introduce you to uh, Africa Apps. I only have two slides and then I'll share them uh, right away. As uh, the saying goes, people can't be what they can't see. STEM Up Foundation started with a notion in mind to help people see what they can become. And uh, in the last three years of our existence, we have been founded uh, to, to work within the Ontario community. Some of the work that we are focused on has been within the black communities, minority, com and minority communities, including the female communities, and really focusing on the underserved communities. In the last three years, we have offered free hands-on programs, mentorship opportunities, and scholarship opportunities to students who are struggling because of financial situation. We have recently, as you know, moved a lot of our programs remotely, but our vision and mission remain the same. Our vision is to ensure that individuals can thrive in different careers, unhindered by any systemic, uh, uh, systemic issues that usually limit people with minority backgrounds. And this is why we have founded our programs, mentorship opportunities to enable you navigate as you go through corporate Canada, uh, STEM and some programs to enable young people understand the possibilities and opportunities in STEM, scholarship opportunities to enable people who can't afford to go to school finally get a chance to do that. Our mission has never been as strong as it has been uh, before because of the Black Lives Matter uprising that has happened in 2020, we have continued to support our community. And we hope that moving forward, that issues such as the uprising of Black Lives Matter will be a thing of the past because we are hoping that through our work, some young people will get the economic empowerment that they need to not only be leaders, but to be thriving leaders within their fields. Yeah, I have a slide here for anyone interested in some of our programs. As I have mentioned, we have a scholarship program called STEM Scholars that we're proud to announce that this year we have selected two students who would receive $5,000 each by next week to be able to support their schooling. We also have continued our STEM in program. Today we announced our 20 for 20 uh, STEM in program where we will select 20 young people within the age of 11 to 14 within Ontario, who would go through a 20 week program with STEM, in, with STEM Hub. So if you have young kids at home, this is an opportunity to enroll them and let them go through a coaching that will offer them the skill sets that can transcend um, from one area to another as they grow. STEM skills is really this tech masterclass that we're having provision of hands-on skills to professionals to help them advance their careers. Lastly, we still have a mentorship program. If anyone is on here today wondering about how can I find a mentor as I navigate through Co Corporate America or Corporate Canada, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to find you a mentor in your field to help guide you as you go through your career. Well, this is all I have for STEM Hub. Please follow us on social media as we plan for series three. As we go on today, I'll be sending out testimonials. Please be ready to help us fill testimonials because this will help guide our decision to, towards the Tech Masterclass series three. Uchi. Sure, thanks Dr. Adi. So I'm gonna share my uh, screen.
So my name is Uchi Uchibeke, and I'm the founder of Africa Hacks. Africa Hacks was started because we noticed that for in Africa and also for people of African descent, there is lots of opportunity due to the big challenges. And what we're doing is we're leveraging the fact that there are lots of youth, about 70% of youth, the African population are youth. We're leveraging that fact and providing programs that makes it possible to create companies very fast. So we're a digital economy platform for everyone. And what, how we do this is that anyone can come to Africa Hacks with an idea and we provide the tools, the training, the platforms, and also all of the resources that they need to create a startup. So they don't have to pay for Amazon cl cloud services. They don't have to pay for marketing, all of those things. We have partners that provide all of these resources to members of our community so they can create companies successfully. And the vision is that we want to accelerate the creativity of people of African descent so that they can build companies to make their lives, the lives of their family and the world better. All right? Because ultimately we want to be able to look back, say three to five years from now and say that maybe the 10, com 10 companies have been created because they were part of our hackathon and they moved on to join our, our incubation program. So we just actually launched a new website. You can check it out, africahas.com. And also we're having two hackathons in December. So Niger Hacks 2020 and the North America Africa Hackathon. The purpose of these two hackathons is to create a, an avenue for participants to come with an idea and then validate that idea with a team. And the top teams would go on to join our incubation program. And this incubation program is supported by uh, Amazon, Twilio, and other companies that provide all of the resources that these companies would need to be successful. And this is where to apply for the hackathon, apply.africas.com. And this link contains everything that we do. So I'm really excited to be working with uh, STEM Hub Foundation because we, our visions align and we want to be able to look back, both organizations, like in three years or five years from now and see that we, we impacted uh, some youth in the community. So that's all for Africa Hacks. I'm going to pass it on now to Dr. Adi. Okay, Maya. Thank you, Uchi. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Joel Lassam. I'm the CEO of uh, Firmex. Oh, sorry. Uh, Adiola, are you going to do the introduction? Go ahead. Yes. Should I, I go ahead? Your mute, Doctor. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I just realized. Uh, thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, as, as, as the tagline for STEM Hub goes, you can't be what you can't see. We're very thrilled to have Joel, Joel here today to help lead us, not only in a conversation, but also to help us understand what we can become if we put in the hard work and if we are not afraid to fail. Joel is the Chief Executive Officer for Femex, and Joel has over 25 years of experience in successfully accelerating revenues of growth businesses. Under his leadership, Femex is rapidly becoming a standard for sharing large volumes of highly confidential and sensitive documents for corporate transactions, litigation, and, and compliance. Proud to co-founding Femex in 2006, Joel drove the U.S. growth of Point First Inc., leading to the company's acquisition in 20, 2004. In 2009, Joel co-founded Crescent Logic, a software company that provided online equity research public publishing tools for investment banks. He is a frequent speaker at CEO forums and industry events. Joel studied history of philosophy and science and holds a Master of Arts from the University of Toronto and a Bachelor's of Arts from McGill University in Montreal. Joel, personally, you are an inspiration and I believe you're an example of a leader that we need to see so that we can realize our potential. We're very happy to have you keynote today. We're ready, thank you. Okay, thank you, Adiola. Um, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, well, I'm Joel, and I'm going to present to you today uh, 
I guess, uh, my journey, my entrepreneurial journey and things that you should think about if you want to take the entrepreneurial path. And so I'm going to begin by, um, uh, and then I'm going to go through a, a presentation. It's about 20 odd slides. And then afterwards, we're going to have a question and answer. Um, so I'm going to get started now. Go to this part here. Okay, good. Can you see the uh, Adiola? Can you see the screen here? Is that yes, successfully yes, shared? Did. Okay, so I'm going to talk. I mean, this there's a lot to talk about when starting a business. Um, can, can I interject? Is it okay? Is it possible to make it to go to presentation mode? Uh, okay, I'm in presentation mode here. Uh, we can still see it. Yeah, I'm just trying to think on I don't not zoom here. Because can you which are the tech person? Yeah, Help that me. option. Yes, that one. The the yeah the one you were you had your mouse on before on the right here? bottom bottom right. Bottom right of uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, I've got it in presentation mode on my PowerPoint. Hmm. I think we okay. can keep going. Yeah, we can okay. still see it. Is it is it most of the screen? We can see most of the screen. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about um, of, of this journey. Um, I'm going to start really with three sections. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and starting Firmex. And then I'm going to talk about product market fit, which is the most critical part of um, any business when, when you start any business, which is means the market would actually be interested in it. And then the final piece I'm going to talk about is um, uh, capital, uh, fundraising, uh, pros and cons of raising capital. And, and, and so that's going to be the, the, the set of the, uh, the presentation, which is really how, you know, fundamentally the early part of a business. Okay. So let's begin here. So I'm going to give you a little personal background. I had to dig, dig around here. Um, so um, I come from a family that immigrated to Toronto. We actually lived at, I don't know if it's still a food city at Jane and Finch, but we lived at Jane and Finch when I first got here. Um, and uh, it was a very multicultural community. This is the 1970s. And, uh, so that was my formative experience. Um, I later, my, my family um, later moved to the Young and Eglinton area in Toronto. And I, um, I was working a lot. I worked after school. I worked in the Green Pea parking lots downtown. Um, you know, so it was always a sense of, you know, work hard uh, of you. And I was also quite entrepreneurial as a kid too. I had lots of paper routes. I had all sorts of, uh, my parents really didn't give any money, so I had to figure out how to how to earn money. And so uh, I graduated from Northern Secondary High School, which is in Toronto. Uh, I later graduated, as Adiola said, from a history degree. I really want to understand how this all came to be. I kind of saw myself as an anthropologist from outer space. I kind of would try to understand the world, go back in time. Uh, I wasn't really thinking too hard about a career. Um, as you can see, I got a job planting trees in Northern Ontario and British Columbia in the summers. That's me there with my tent, which I had to live in for months at a time. Uh, but after I graduated from history, I realized, you know, I, I really had to do something else for a living. And so that led me to asking people for advice. And because I had no technical skills, no professional skills, because I had an arts degree, uh, I was told you're not qualified to do anything. You'll have to go into sales, uh, which was something I wasn't expecting to do. Uh, here's an interesting fact. More arts graduates, the, the number one uh, category to start tech companies are engineers, followed by arts graduates because they have nothing to lose, I suppose. Business grads tend to get really good jobs, and so they don't end up starting as many companies. Anyway, I got a job, believe it or not, selling brassiers for uh, a, a large company called Playtex, which is not what, what I expected to be doing. And that's a picture of me winning a sales award. Um, so I learned a, 
to to start uh, selling and I got a job. I ended up not like work, didn't like working for a large company. So I was only there for a year. I want to interject, so, Joe. Yeah. I, I'm being told by the audience that the screen seems to be frozen. So they're still saying the first slide, which is starting and cap the, 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 the title slide. Okay. That we're not seeing yet. Does that work? No, it's still frozen. Because I'm changing it on my end. No, it's not changing. Okay. Uh, should have tested this. Uh... Do you have two screens? Yeah. Maybe that's why. <laughs> I'm changing it on both screens. Now it's changing. Okay. Do you see that? Okay, I'll go back to presentation mode. Okay. Is it changing now? Yes. Okay, I'll use this other control. I apologize, everybody. Um, so you can see this screen. Life happens when you're making other plans. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. So that was just the story I told you. There's a picture of me um, working in in the northern Canada um, before I, um, and then I had to figure out um, a living for myself. Um, as you can see, uh, this is the screen I was just talking about, um, where I was, um, you know, got a job in sales because I really wasn't qualified to do anything with an arts degree. And I started working for entrepreneurs in 1994. First, I started selling gray marketed Apple computers. Um, and then I got involved in the internet emerged and I got involved in selling, um, you know, web development. Uh, which was really exciting. And I decided working for small entrepreneurs, I learned, you know, a fair bit. I learned some good things and I learned some things not to do. I, I decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I started my first startup in 1999, um, which failed. And it was really tough. Uh, I worked 16 hours a day and I worked eight hours a day on weekends. Um, I spent all my, my savings and uh, the business failed. And we can certainly talk about that later. Um, but that was a tough lesson. Uh, that was a very tough lesson. I took it pretty hard. But I picked myself up again and I started working as a salesperson for other unfunded B2B businesses. And um, five years later, I, I took another uh, chance at starting a business in 2005. That's when I wrote the business plan. But by now I was 38 years old and I had a family and uh, I was a primary source of income. So Failure was really not an option now. I had people to feed, so I really wanted to make sure that this one, this time we succeeded. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Can you see that, Adiola? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, good. All right, super. So the rules for the second startup, one, failure is not an option. I'm just too old to fail now. And two, don't raise too much money, and we'll talk about that. Don't overcapitalize the business. Go sell thousands of customers. This is where most startups fail, right? This is the commercialization of the startup. And number four, if we make money, i.e. profit, we can't lose. See rule number one, right? And so and this is a little different. This is where Firmex differed from a lot of tech companies that run at a loss. You'll see a lot of them report growth at all costs. I wanted to make sure that we succeeded because it was really important to, to me and, and my family and my business partners that the company was successful. And there's a picture of, our, this is an excerpt for the business plan I wrote right here. And you can see that's me um, in the early days. I was, this is when uh, I was the acting CEO, CFO, CMO, salesperson, fundraiser, you name it. Um, I built this Ikea desk here and uh, I, I was, uh, it was just myself and a, and a couple of developers. That's how we started. Um, and so this was first year of commercial operations. I was saying earlier to Adiola and Uchi, Uchi that really when you start a business, there are two key skills. Someone's going to make the stuff and someone's going to sell the stuff. Everything else is sort of, you know, valuable later, but those are the really important skills. Now, sometimes you find it in the same person, but often you, you'll, you'll notice that co-founders, one is technical and one is sales orientated. You usually pair up. And so um, that's your minimal viable company salesperson and engineer. Um, the other thing I highly recommend if you're planning to start a company 
You want to write a business plan? I actually license for $100. You can go to any online. You can see these business plan pro um, here. You buy a business plan software. It's really easy. It forces you to really think about your plan and you know your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, all that kind of thing. And it produces all sorts of really nice graphs in, 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 in revenue and financial matters. So when you show it to people, it looks really professional. So that's a little tip there. Okay. I'm going to go to the next slide. All right. So what is the history of Firmex? Well, it took us about twice as the original plan was five years and that we'd get for to 12 million in revenue in five years. Well, it took us almost twice as long to get to 12 million in revenue. But at the end, it didn't really matter. As you can see the growth of the company here consistently every year. And you can see the green is the profitability of the business, right? We started off that I did raise capital. I raised $4 million from angel investors, but I was selling product right away. When you're selling product right away, it gives people a lot of confidence they, they can invest um, behind you. I, that's the total amount of capital I raised, just the $4 million. By 2010, the business had become profitable and we've been profitable. We've been running either cash break even and obviously profitable ever since. Now, something else happens and you might, might be new to some of you. The, wh whenever you take investor money, there's one challenge. You have to give it back. <laughs> you can't hold on to it forever. So Firmex had a liquidity event. We were sold a majority to private equity fund. And that's a master class in itself about the whole private equity industry. Um, and, and basically they're relatively short-term investors. They, they, they buy uh, stock off of other investors and the business continued to grow and they sold their equity to another private equity fund here for a profit uh, last year. And, um, and so Firmex continues to, uh, these, are, these are what are called liquidity events. Um, and uh, now founders got a chance and managers got a chance to sell some stock in these liquidity events as well. But that's a massive industry that's growing a lot. You don't have to go public to see liquidity for your shares now with such a big private equity industry. There's over a trillion dollars, a trillion, that's with a T, of dry powder in this industry buying viable businesses. So um, it's an issue. So that's the history of the company. I, uh, I had a five-year plan. I'm, uh, what is it now, 14 years into my five-year plan. Um, that's another lesson I learned, and we'll talk about it, is when you do start a business, this isn't a short-term thing for the vast majority of businesses that are successful. It's a 15 to 20 year journey. And so um, we'll talk about that a little more later. Okay. Um, so what is Firmex? So just a little quick uh, about Firmex. We are a cloud-based facility to share confidential documents, primarily for large corporate transactions. So if you're gonna buy a business, for 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 million, 100 million, billion dollars, you probably want to check a few facts before you sign on the dotted line. That's called diligence. And these, these documents that the business provide are very, very confidential. They don't want it being sent around by email or sitting in Dropbox. They want it in a very secure system that has a Q&A question and answer functionality that has all sorts of security around the documents. Some of them you will not be able to print or forward. There's a bunch of workflow in there that are specific to mergers and acquisitions and corporate finance. And we'll talk a lot about specific workflows and starting a business. That market, these are language terms that you, you either, some of you may know already or don't, that TAM, that total addressable market worldwide for this type of software is $800 million. To some people that might sound like a lot, but it's actually not, and to most venture capitalists, it's under a billion, so it's a subscale TAM. But still, 800 million is a lot of money to go look go after as far as business is concerned. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We have about 30 competitors worldwide, probably a five or probably about 10 that really matter. We license our software to business customers in 66 different countries. You can see roughly split 20, 30% Canada, 50% US, 20% EMEA. Uh, we do have some African customers, not very many, but we do have a few. Um, it's a remarkable thing, the internet now. You can distribute globally without ever leaving your home office in Toronto. It's, it's, just, it's just amazing. Um, it's a big change in the, the software paradigm over the last 15 years. 
Another thing that's really valuable about a business is no single customer makes up more than 1% of our revenue. Um, we have thousands of customers. So that's, that's called no customer concentration. That is something to investors that's really valuable. So if you lose your biggest customer, it's not a big deal. Um, uh, we have 92% gross margins. Gross margins is your cost of delivering the service. Uh, sorry, a gross margin is what's available after the cost you deliver the service. So in our case, it's hosting and our support team, right? It's the higher your gross margin, the more likely that you'll have a very profitable business. Businesses that involve a lot of services um, or a lot of free uh, storage would have much lower gross margin, right? And the business earns as a result, 30% profit margins. And so these are some important concepts to understand, you know, the financial mechanics of your business. What, what, kind, of, what kind of profitability, what kind of margins would this kind of company have in the future. And um, that alone is a whole other uh, class. But um, these are things that I, I learned, you know, working for others or being and reading lots on the internet. I don't have a formal business education, but the internet provides you one. So it's, uh, um, these are really important metrics when it comes to uh, building an attractive business. We have 110 employees in Toronto, 100 in Toronto. We have 10 in London, England. We've never had a layoff in our company history. We have something, someone you might be familiar with, Glassdoor. Uh, Glassdoor is an anonymous rating website for companies. Um, we have a very high rating on Glassdoor. It's something as a CEO I'm, I'm very proud of. It's important to me you know, beyond commercial success that we have engaged um, and happy employees. It's just, just emotionally important that the team is happy. Um, and that's something you learn as a leader that, you know, you're, you're only as happy or even as a parent in a family, you're only as happy as your team. So, um, so in some, you know, the, the business has been successful. It's been a lifelong dream of mine to build a successful business. And here I am at 53 years old uh, with one. So it took a while. Um, I decided at 20, I think I probably was going to start a business, um, it was not uh, a short journey, but it is a journey you can achieve. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Okay, this is the really critical part. This is where most businesses fail. And you've probably heard this 80, 90% of startups fail. It's a very high failure rate. And that the number one item that they fail at is this product market fit. And I'd also call timing and economics. This is binary to success or failure. If this isn't down the fairway, as the saying goes, like right down, you know, on target, you are not going to succeed no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you have great people. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred million dollars. You probably heard there was a streaming service. It was called Quibble or something out of out of Hollywood. They spent one point six billion dollars and shut down after six months. It does not matter if you don't get this first part right. Everything else is is uh, is irrelevant. The second piece of this. I would say, in my opinion, that's important. If you do have product market, you're, you're going to have a business. You're probably going to have a business no matter what. It's just a matter of how successful that business will depend on the people involved in the business, right? So um, I've seen some pretty poorly run companies be successful with great product market fit. So um, could they have been more successful? Yes, but they can still be successful. But that's important. And I would say the tertiary mover is capital. And, and this is a big misconception in the market that everything needs a lot of capital. And I'll give you some examples, many examples where there has been no capital. And these are mainly software businesses I'm talking about. Um, and they've been successful. It's nice to have. It can be helpful. It can also be destructive. And we'll talk about that. Um, but it is a tertiary mover. All right. Let's go into the next slide. So let's talk about this really important thing about how do I validate a business idea, right? And I've written some language here and look, this is a, there is much to talk about here, but these are the things that in my mind are really, really important. And keep in mind, I'm a person that, I'm a very analytical person. I, um, I like, I like, again, back to that comment, I really didn't want to fail starting a business close to 40 years old. So failure wasn't an option. I'd learned, I'd learned from uh, uh, 
challenges I've had and other, other entrepreneurs had. And so the first thing I'm going to look for in a business is there commercial proof this business has been successful or this category has been successful already. Because I can tell you it's unusual for anyone to have a unique idea. It's almost unheard of. We all live in the same media ecosystem. Um, most successful businesses, if you look at the uh, search or uh, CRM, they're not the first companies to start a business in that category. Google wasn't the first person to do search. Um, Apple wasn't the first person to come out with an MP3 player. You know, they're not, this category already had some traction. So I always look at, are there other businesses that are emerging in this space that are being able to grow without a, a, a ton of capital? That's the first thing I'll look for. Um, a lot of times I'll run into people with startups and they'll say, you know, I've got this great piece of technology and, uh, you know, my salespeople are useless. They can't sell it or, you know, it's ahead of its time or whatever the case is. There's always a reason other than the technology. And the fact is, that's true. Sometimes it is ahead of its time. So that's the timing piece. There are, there are software categories like the board portal software. Now we have software for board of directors. Well, that came out in 2000, but no one wanted to use it until the iPad came out in 2010. So for those companies for 10 years, the market wasn't ready for board portal software. As soon as the iPad came out, it exploded. So timing is really important. You're looking for those companies that, oh boy, those companies are getting some traction. We should look into this space, right? Um, you know, uh, and so you can be ahead of its time or simply the product really isn't that useful. Um, it's really, you know, it's interesting, um, but it just really doesn't, it's not interesting enough for people to purchase it. Um, you know, I have a friend I just played tennis with. He had a successful exit. He just sank $6 million into a consumer-based contact management app of money he had made from selling his last company. And he just wound it down last week. Didn't matter. Ended up with $10,000 in revenue. So, so you got to be careful. Okay, market size and competition. So since to think about it, how many target customers are do I have? Is it tens of thousands? And I'm really talking about business to business. So just to clarify, business to consumer businesses are very challenging and very capital intensive to start. And so you can have a lot more success in business to business technology. Uh, where you're selling to other businesses because it tends to be much nichier and fragmented. Okay. So in those niches, how many target customers do I have? Are there many competitors? Actually having a lot of competitors isn't necessarily a bad thing. It means that the market is healthy. That is actually other companies have uh, uh, business people, entrepreneurs have had found ways to be successful. But is it fragmented? Are there lots of small ones or is it a dominant company in a small niche market? That's gonna be very hard to win against unless you really got something on them, right? So I look for an environment where it's fragmented. You see other entrepreneurs have been successful in this space. Okay, so the other thing um, and I say on the right there on that box is, um, I tend to prefer what I call a medium-sized addressable market, 500 million to a billion, not too small, too small for the big players. You don't want to be competing against Microsoft or Google or someone who's got $100 million in venture capital. It's like, it's like trying to, you know, I don't know, it's, <laughs> they're gonna, you're going to get steamrolled. You, there's nothing you can do against those. Those guys are just too tough. It, 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 the odds of success are much lower. But it's large enough if it's fragmented for you to take a piece of that pie, right? If there's, you know, 20, 30, 40 competitors, you know, over, you know, uh, 750 million, much like Firmex, there's enough of that to build a material business to go around. Okay. Um, timing. When did this category start? I'm going to call it a category, like a software category. When did it start? Five years ago, 15, 30? So typically speaking, when it first starts, not always. The world doesn't really know about it. Companies can spend a lot of money educating a market. That's a really painful thing to do. It's very expensive. The market doesn't understand it yet. 
But sometimes if you can get in around five or 10 years in, the market already understands it and it's growing, meaning it's people are adopting that technology for the first time. It's what we call greenfield. That's a really good timing window. In our space, the virtual data room space, all the companies got in between 2000 and 2010. It was a lot easier if you got in from 2005 to 2010 in the second five years. After 2010, it became very saturated with the competitors and it's tougher to take market share where, there, where, where the mar there is no greenfield left. I call greenfield where people haven't even adopted the technology. Okay. Um, all right, buyer attributes. So what are you looking for in people who buy your software? Well, first of all, questions to ask, is it a long sales cycle? Does it take people six months, these businesses to make a decision? Those, those can be very capital intensive. If it takes a long time for them to buy, it means it takes a long time for you to get cash into your business, right? Um, do decisions, yes, I mentioned that. Um, are the industries you're selling to expanding or contracting? So there was a company that had a lot of um, press. It was a young guy who started out of the University of Waterloo called Polar in Toronto. I never forget. And because he was young and, you know, um, uh, he's really good with the media, he got tons of media. Um, he sold to newspapers, media. Uh, he connected newspapers with mobile apps. Well, guess what? The business has not grown at all in the last 10 years because the newspaper industry has shrunk a lot. Um, so be, be thinking about that. Like if you can get into an industry where you have a workflow for renewable energy, for example, there's an industry with tailwinds that's growing, right? So think about industries that are growing, uh, obviously can be helpful. And does that have that industry have ample funds to invest in technology? So, for example, there have been countless startups who have decided they've built technology for other startups. Well, guess what? Startups don't have any money. So don't bother. This is going to be a tough sell, right? You, you want to get into an industry that is, uh, has ample money to make investments. Okay. Um, all right. That's your first kind of high level business validation. The next one is, okay, get into some more detail. This is just two slides here right now for um, product market fit. Are the competitors growing? Go on LinkedIn, see if they're adding headcount. Are they adding people, right? Um, if your competitors are doing well, that's a great sign. People always think, oh, no, I don't want my competitor. No, you want your competitors to do well. That means the market is, there's a lot of what they call pull in the market. The market wants the product. Um, what do they charge? And how are you going to differentiate? You don't have to differentiate a lot. You don't have to be a completely different system, but you got to have an angle. It's either you've got a different pricing model. You might have some different, a slightly different technology, but there's something that differentiates because a lot of times you get into these, um, these sale processes and there's, you're competing against two or three other competitors to win that customer's business. So you got to have a little bit of an angle that you competitive, or maybe you're going after an underserved market. You know, um, maybe uh, in you know in Canada there's not as many competitors as in other places, or in, I know of someone who did really well in India selling virtual data room technology. Right, this market was big enough, and so forth. So on. But you have to have some kind of angle. Um, okay, and really you need to think: How am I going to win against these competitors? And winning against competitors is not just a technology thing. It can be a commercial thing, but it also can be how good your sales people are. Are they good at their craft? Do they listen to their customers or prospects, you know, and so forth and so on. So there's lots of ways to win. Um, and that's the nature of business. It's competitive. Um, whether you're, you, even if you're early to market, you will compete over time. If you're in a, you have a business for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, trust me, you're going to compete competing all the time. The other thing I'd like to say is street level, I call it sort of street level intelligence. So if you think you've got a category that looks really interesting, go find some ex salespeople who are selling in that category. Go talk to them, ask them, how's it going? You know, how, what were the sales cycles like? Um, you know, um, you know, what was the growth like? You know, you can talk to people who did product support. What were the biggest challenges customers have? These are really valuable pieces of information that give you ideas on differentiation. Um, I actually did this on a, before I started Firmex, I had another opportunity to start a business. 
with another piece of software. And I did this analysis and, and I remember talking to, I went to a trade show where this, this was called knowledge management software. And I asked the salespeople, how's it going? You've been at this 10 years. Oh, this is really tough. It takes customers forever to make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I looked at the category. I talked to people in the space. It was a very narrow niche and I decided against it. Um, I decided against it. Okay. Business plan. So the final step. So if you think you really have something, you've done a lot of research, um, and yeah, odds are you might have to end up researching 10 different possible businesses and maybe you come up with one. Maybe you have to research 50 and you come up with one that looks really good, that checks all the boxes. Then you need to write a business plan. You know, well, I recommend you write a business plan so you have some kind of guide. It's going to change 100 times, but at least start out. As I mentioned, get a business plan software for 100 bucks. It'll send you a lot, save you tons and tons of time. Um, you know, how long is it going to take you to build a viable product? You know, how much money is that going to cost? Can you do it without capital? Can you team up with some engineers and you all just, you know, work for sweat equity to get a minimal viable product um, to test market with? How, once you start selling it, how long is it going to take you to get to cash break even? What are your sales and marketing costs going to be? Um, you know, and we're going to talk about what is it that you want at the end of the day for your own return. And we're going to talk about what's your number in a minute, but this is really, really important when it comes to raising capital. So, and just assume everything in your plan, it'll take twice as long to achieve. Whatever you say, it, it just does. It, it, you need time. Time is a tremendous, of tremendous value in any business. Um, so always make sure that you have um, ample time to keep going. Okay. Capital. So the next section, the final section here I'm going to talk about is capital, and then we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, if I can interject, Joe, Joe uh, for people who are listening to us, please start dropping your questions in the Q&A box as uh, we would uh, be picking some of your questions from there. Thank you. Okay. So... First of all, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I got involved, and I'll tell you part of the reason. In, in 2010, I got involved with an association called PeerScale. And the reason I did, someone came to me and said, you know, the difference between Silicon Valley and Toronto is that in Silicon Valley, everyone talks to each other. Everyone helps each other. You know, in Toronto, we're more isolated. We're Canadians. We're a little more, you know, conservative. We're not... Uh, communicating with each other enough. And it's really important. One of the key parts of innovation is to be able to steal each other's idea, amicably that is, right? Because most of our product companies, we don't compete because we're niche little products, right? But we all have operating challenges and we all talk to each other. So PeerScale, at this time, there were 85 members, there were about 100 members. I was involved in recruiting about a third of the CEOs into this group. It's all Toronto-based. Combined, we have about 1.3 billion in revenues out of Toronto. Uh, all Toronto founded, founders out of Toronto, about 7,000 employees. So I have a big network of, the, of Joel Lessonson <laughs> out there. And so um, now what's really interesting, I did this survey when I was on the board on the membership. I got involved. They wanted me to you know, drive membership. And I did a survey. Here's a remarkable number. 50% of the members were unfunded. 25 were angel funded and 25 were venture capital funded. The interesting part is on this graph, you can see the unfunded members had more revenue, average revenue, than the venture funded or the angel funded members. Well, how is this possible? Well, this goes back to my old point, is capital is a tertiary mover. Um, now, a lot of them got started, they might have written some custom software for one customer, and then they went out and started selling to other customers. You know, usually it's something like that. This is the way they bootstrap. Um, and remarkably, those, of course, those unfunded customers uh, are uh, entrepreneurs or their co-founders. When they sold their companies, they had 100% or close to 100% of their shares. And so they've all done extremely well. But this is a remarkable thing. You don't hear a lot about this in the media because they don't hire PR agencies like the venture capital funds about funding and funding camps, but there are a lot of them around. It's a very silent community that employs many thousands of people in Toronto. Um, 
and it is possible to build companies without capital funding, right? Not saying you should, but it, it certainly, if you can, it's, um, it's, it's, it has tremendous uh, financial returns. Okay, um, let's keep going. So here's my point. Many tech businesses do not require capital to be successful. This is different if you're in pharmaceuticals, very capital intensive. You wanna take a drug to market, it's gonna cost you a billion dollars. Or in mining, you wanna build a mine, it's gonna cost you hundreds of millions of dollars. But if you wanna build software, you just need to either be an engineer or have engineers as co-founders and they work nights and you can build some software without a lot of capital. You just need a computer, right? So um, I would say in other words, if a tech business cannot be successful without capital, it's probably not a good business to be in the first place. Okay. All right. Next slide. Here's another example. I pulled this off the internet. You know, people always think about, oh, I'm going to go get funded. This is Anderson Horowitz. It's a famous Silicon Valley venture capital fund. On an annual basis, they get 3,000 applications for funding. Of that, they look at 200 seriously, 6.7%. And of that, they fund 20. So it's a, it's a tough road to go uh, necessarily to venture capital. Obviously, there's you know, all sorts of business plans that get thrown at them. But you can see the, 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 um, the funnel here. It's so don't count on getting funded. Venture capital passed, out, passed on a lot of companies that ended up being very successful. But it's, um, they, are, they are swamped with, um, with, with folks uh, looking for funding. Here's the other fact that the venture capital community doesn't like to talk about. Of the, here is 1,098 US seed tech, seed tech companies, and these companies have got a seed round, which nowadays is in the millions of dollars, low millions of dollars. Only 29% of them were sold for amount greater than $0. <laughs> and here's the kicker. The investors get their capital out before the founders get any money. It's called preferred shares preferred investment, that's their priority. So the vast majority of businesses they even fund are not good businesses, right? Again, showing you that capital is not a primary mover. A lot of them, the entrepreneur people get very excited. They've raised capital, um, you know, they, they chirp about it, they tweet about it. Um, but I know so many that it is a boulevard of broken dreams because they've raised this capital. And then unfortunately in five or 10 years, they walk away from their businesses. So again, just keep in mind, raising capital is not necessarily the path to success. Um, and these are important uh, pieces of uh, data to consider. However, if you do raise capital, here's some important considerations. And I've raised capital. So um, the first one, and I give this talk, I give this talk a few times, is I ask this question, I give a talk to the, there's a Founders Institute, it's a, uh, sort of an, uh, people pay that they're trying to start businesses to, to learn about how to start a business there. And they get, have me go there and talk about, and this is one of my favorite questions. If I gave you a dice today and you had to roll it, what number would you pick based on the probability of success? Would you pick 1% chance of making $100 million personally, 10% chance of making $10 million, 20% chance of making $5 million or 50% chance of making $2 million. And the vast majority of people, and so this is funny, I'll go into a room, they've just had a talk about how to raise money from venture capitalists. And I'll go in and ask them this question and the vast majority will pick, I'll take 2 million for 50%, thank you very much. <laughs> Who wouldn't, right? It's a lot of money. Um, or they're certainly in the two to five million category. If, you're, if your plan is to make $2 million, you shouldn't raise money at all, right? Because it's a venture capitalists are trying to hit home runs out of the park. They're looking for $100 million exits. But the challenge is they'll only get, um, I'll give you an example. I'm good friends with um, um, the general partner and managing director of Canada's largest uh, C Venture Fund called Real Ventures. We swim on the same swim team. Her name is Janet Bannister. They make a hundred investments. They're hoping one of those investments out of a hundred ends up being a home run. They'll wind down 60% of them. 
So, and the rest might be somewhere in between making a little bit of money or something like that. So something to think about, I know a lot of really successful small tech companies that uh, founders have bootstrapped it out. You know, maybe there's two of them. They end up selling it, you know, 10, 12 years later for 6 million bucks. They never took any capital and they split it. And that's, you know, $3 million for most people is pretty life-changing. <laughs> it's pretty significant. And so something to think about, again, uh, when you think about risk, just because, and we're going to talk about uh, risk later. The other thing this little exercise does before you start a company is it keeps you in check. I honestly, when I started Firmex, I, um, I had a house. I, I owned a house. Uh, the house price had gone up. So I think, um, you know, the house was I probably worth, uh, I had a mortgage of $400,000. And I thought to myself, if, if this company pays off my mortgage, I should be happy. <laughs> right? You know, ground yourself on a, on a number. What happens, and I got this from a, a, someone gave me some advice early on, is people get greedy later. The business has success and they keep going. And, and sometimes it can have quite devastating results because they could have sold it. And then, you know, businesses are never sure things. You know, 10 years in, it was really successful. 20 years in, it wasn't successful. And, um, you know, they raised money and then they ended up having to pay all their investors back first and they end up walking away with very little. It reminds me of the story of Icarus. It's a famous Greek myth where Icarus... Uh, and his father, they get some wings to fly off, uh, escape an island. And father tells his son, Icarus, don't fly too close to the sun. Your wings will melt and you'll crash. This is kind of what happens to some entrepreneurs. <laughs> and so um, ground yourself on a number. Pick a number and keep it focused. Um, and it's really important. Um, so, you know, to give an example, when I, I had two other co-founders on the technical side and they said, I said, what's our number? And they said, well, we'd like to make $5 million. And I said, okay. So if we sell 50% of the company for our 4 million bucks, we'll have to sell it for $30 million one day. It's really simple math, right? And you focus on building your business to that goal of, okay, well, how much revenue am I going to need to get 30 million? Well, I'm going to need at least probably 10 or 12 million based on, you know, modest valuations to get that kind of exit. So really important to pick a number. And it's really important that you and your partners are aligned on that number. Um, if one of your partners wants to do 100 and you want to do two, you guys are going to, you're going to have conflict later. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the time and I better, I, I'm almost done here. Um, this is a master class in itself. I actually sent a copy of this survey to Adiola. This is the language of investors. This, this is the key, key performance indicators that they look at uh, on a regular basis. Um, it's everything from, you know, annual recurring revenue and churn rates and growth and, you know, cost of goods. And these are all financial terms. If you want to raise money from investors, you're going to have to be able to speak their language. Um, this is a 47 page document. As I say, this is a master, long master class, probably several master classes in and of itself, um, but really valuable. Uh, happy to walk through it at some stage. I'm just checking the time. I think I'm getting, I'm, I'm almost out of time here. So, um, okay. The other point is the most important thing you have in life and in your business is time. The longer you have, the more flexible your outcome can be. When you have capital, they'll want it back. Right. And sometimes over a short period of time, the more capital you have, the greater the hurdle it is that you're going to have to achieve. Because remember, they get their money back first. So just be careful on how much you capitalize your business and how long you got to make it successful. I'm going to go next slide. Um, all right. I'm just wrapping up here. I got one more slide after this. So again, um, most financially successful tech entrepreneurs that I know did not raise capital at all. And um, I actually belong to another club of those, those folks. Um, however, if you do take on investors, it is a great responsibility. Um, that treat their money as your own money. As a CEO, you are responsible to all shareholders or your partners, right? So you want to do a fair deal with your investors. Um, you're going to have them for a long time and they're going to be an important part of your, um, your, uh, your, your experience. Final comments. 
Um, starting a business is not a marathon. Is, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, most founders that I know in Toronto on the pure scale, it's 10 to 20 years before a major liquidity event. Right? 10 to 20 years. Uh, so pick your co-founders carefully. This is a long-term relationship. Treat it like a marriage, right? You don't just sort of get married on the first date, or most people don't anyway. Um, you know, make sure um, co founder conflict can be disastrous for business. Um, it's very hard to live with. That was actually the reason my first startup failed. It's just really, really challenging. The co-founder was my girlfriend's sister's husband, and it was sort of convenient, and, you know, it was just kind of done on a napkin, and it, I, I learned my lesson. You really want to have great chemistry and you want both have good, you know, emotional intelligence, be empathetic towards each other. Really, really important. Uh, don't tie your identity to your business. Beyond impacting personal relationships, like, you know, you become so obsessed with it that you stop caring for people around you. If it fails, you'll be psychologically devastated. Uh, I know this from experience. After my first business fail, I don't think I came out of my apartment for four months. Right. So don't do that. <laughs> it's not good for your mental health. <laughs> um, and keep in mind, this is my personal story. Of course, if you don't, first don't succeed, life is full of second chances. Right. So um, which is all, all good. Um, and if successful, it won't be your business. As it grows and adds employees, a business is like a child that will develop its own identity and its own culture and its own way of thinking. You should embrace that. You need to give it autonomy. Let it flourish. Um, give your staff autonomy to help drive the culture. So that's another thing. Sometimes entrepreneurs are very possessive about their business. All right. All right, uh, Adiola, that's my, uh, my presentation. Thank you so much, Joel. I was busy taking notes. Uh, I think um, I, as, as you were talking, I was, I was sending a message to Uchi that you were talking about him. <laughs> uh, there are some high notes for me uh, personally, when you mentioned on don't tie your identity to your business. I think it's, it's something, it's a note that I have to take a mental note of. And uh, areas when, when you mentioned that if it's successful, it won't be your business. What I found is most founder hold that business, that, that business so close to their art that it's, it's so hard to uh, separate their identity uh, from the business. And when it crashes, it's just mentally devastating and it's, 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 it's just not really good. Um, I have a personal question for you. I get, I get the honor to start people, I'm sorry. And my question is on relationships when you're building a business. Would you advise that you, you your co-founder uh, for a startup be your spouse? What is your take on having family members or, or spouse as part of the business from the get-go? Uh, I think it's you, you increase your risk factor dramatically. <laughs> no, it depends. Look, there have been successful husband and wife or businesses before, you know, that, you know, I... I Actually, it's funny. I know one, a very successful one. They, they were very successful. They sold the business for $150 million with no funding, husband and wife, in 2007. This was a while back. Then they got divorced. <laughs> Afterwards, amicably divorced. They had a lot of money. They're like, oh, yeah. But um, look, the rule of thumb, I, I joined. So when I joined uh, Firmex, it was actually my by accident, you know, by kind of coincident, one of the co-founders was my third cousin, but we weren't very close. Like I was, we found out kind of after the fact, but the other co-founder was his brother-in-law. So there were some family relationships there and there, and, and they, they fought a lot, which was kind of good for me because I could be the peacemaker, but then fought a lot. They didn't fought too bad, but they learned, they learned to be together. But the, this one co-founder really wanted to hire friends and family, like, you know, relatives. And I said, first rule, you can't hire who you can't fire. Mm -hmm. So this is what, I, and, and inevitably the other thing you realize with co-founders is some may be good at a small stage, but as the business gets bigger and bigger, some may become less value, less effective. And that's a, very, that's a very common issue with businesses scale. And they, the person who gets is less effective and they don't have as much responsibility because they're not good at managing lots of staff or whatever it is, they get very resentful, 
right? And so uh, I they agreed to that rule. I said, you can't hire who you can't fire. Because he was used to hiring people in his community, his friends, and whatever. And I was like, no, no, we're not doing that. The other thing you have to be, it's like if you anyone plays sports, if you're in a competitive business environment, you need the best team to win. And sometimes you got to trade some of your players. So you better not be related to them. Like I won't hire anyone in my social circle that I have personal uh, like dinner with or anything like that. It's too close. I don't want to ruin any friendships. So, um, you know, so, uh, so I would say with a uh, husband and wife, it depends. You really have to think about, can it work? Sometimes it does at Eola, but um, there, there can be risks. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move into question and answer, but I, Joe, I want to give you one or two minutes while I talk to the audience about the survey. Um, if, if you want to grab coffee or just for you to uh, take a deep breath. <laughs> so everyone, thank you for being a part of this. Some of you have been with us since the beginning of the uh, Tech Masterclass Series 1. As you know, we are ending this Tech Masterclass Series 2 today. We want your feedback, we want your comments, we want uh, your testimonials so that if we need funding or need any uh, to show in anyone who, is, uh, who wants to contribute to this work what we have done, we want them to hear our progress from you. Uh, I, just, I just posted on the group, on the, on the chat, uh, a, a survey. We want you to take two to three minutes before we get into Q&A to help us put something in there. We want your testimonials. We want to know how you feel about what we've offered in the last six months. We're hoping to have series three next, next, uh, next year. These comments will help us be able to go back to our board of directors and really get their approval. And without these comments, without these testimonials, they may be asking us for the impact. So please take a minute of, or two to help us fill in uh, some, some comments in there. Uh, this is very critical and important to uh, us continuing into series three. While you fill that in, I will be looking through the Q&A right now. And um, uh, we, we hopefully would, would, would not, we want to, we want to keep this uh, such that we don't take Joel's time too much, maybe 20 minutes for the Q&A. Uh, um, I, I would pick first one and then Uchi will pick the second one and then we'll go from back and forth from there. So the link is, Oh, I, I put a link in there. I think I did. Oh, I, I sent a link to the panelists. Pardon me, everyone. Okay, so you have the link now. I've, I've posted in there. So please take your time as you listen to the answers. Please help us fill it in. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, I want to pick this question. It's from Ibrahim. And Ibrahim actually have like three questions. So I'm going to try to combine them. Uh, one of them is, how do you know when you have reached product market fit. The second one is, how do you know when your startup has failed and, you, and, and when to give up? Um, the th the, I think maybe the that, those two from him would be ideal to get answered. Right. Thank you. Well, when you have product market fit, customers are coming to you <laughs> a lot um, and um, you know, it's, um, you're just getting what I call a lot of market pull. It's a term in the industry where the market is pulling you to them. You're not having to go to the market all the time. And, and it, it's it, your sales velocity just picks up dramatically. Um, and that's when you know you have product market fit. Um, you know, again, it, it, and conversely, when you know you don't, I mean, people are just not buying what you're offering. Now, sometimes, you can pivot. Um, I have a very successful story um, of a, a peer, a peer scale. They, they built a product, they went to market, they ran a trial, like a trial, like free trial. They had, they said we had a great free trial We had 800 P or 2000 people signed like this is a sign up for the free trial, but not a single person was willing to pay for the software. <laughs> so uh, conversion rates are terrible. Uh, they pivoted they pointed it at a different industry and, and now it's a $30 million business over six years. So they found the right market. Uh, but if people aren't buying it, um, then it's, it's obviously it's not the right, a uh, right product. Um, move on to one that people buy. Hey, uh, a second question is on failure. That how do you know 
when your startup has failed and you should give up? Well, I, I think it's similar. I mean, you're just not seeing growing sales. You know, I, people ask me and I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't know how to program. Um, and people say, Hey, what do you think of this technology? And I say, does it sell? <laughs> Good technology sells. And that doesn't mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking from a business perspective. You know, I've said to people, look, you know, people have asked me, would I invest or so, you know, I've been asked, but even some small venture come, you know, to evaluate things. And I'd say, well, have you been on a sales call? Go on sales call. People say it's interesting and they're, they're just being polite, right? You know, that's a polite answer. We're not buying. Um, if people come around and, and they start talking to each other, oh, this is how we could use this. And, and they're like, you know, when it'll be available, you know, and, and a week later they call you and they, they sign back a contract. <laughs> then you know you got something. It's really pretty simple. Thank you. Uchi, do you want to go next? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Joe, for the session. It was really insightful. I learned a lot, especially in the area of uh, not focusing on funding, because like in the market, it appears that lots of founders are looking for fund funding, and that can be distracting, right? Because that's kind of what uh, the tech and startup community is really pushing. So thanks for sharing that insight. So I'm going to take the question from Johnson. So they asked, so if a market is, if in a fragmented market, how do, how is, how do you get a good estimate of the total addressable market? So like if the market is fragmented, how do you get it, a good estimate of time? Oh, great question. Um, it's more art than science. <laughs> um, sometimes there's the published reports, they ask for, you know, thousand dollars, I wouldn't pay it, but you know, um, the simplest way to do it probably uh, is to go on the internet and count the number of companies and count the number of employees for each of those companies, if they're on LinkedIn, and you can make an estimate on their operating costs in Can in Canada, certainly it's uh, more in Silicon Valley. The average person with hosting, it's about their total overhead is about a, with the staff is about $170,000 per employee. So if someone's got 10 employees, it's probably a, and they're break even, it's a $1.7 million business. That's how I do it. And so 170,000 per employee, that's because it's, you know, your average salary is about a hundred and it's about 70,000 in overhead. So if you start figuring out how many people work in that pan, like in, that, in, that software, in, the, in those software companies, you at least know how, how many people that, assuming they're not all venture funded, they're like customer funded, how much, how, what are the operating costs for that company? And that'll give you a rough idea, or, or even maybe add a little bit of profit of the revenues of all your competitors. And that'll tell you at least how much the competitors are doing. And then you got to figure out, are they growing? Are they all growing? If they're all growing, it means there's greenfield in the market. Right, because if there were no greenfield, they'd just be taken from each other. They wouldn't all be growing. So it'll be going up. So it'll be going down. Right. So if they're all growing, count the employees, count the growth, multiply the employees by one hundred seventy thousand dollars, and you can see how much of the market at least has been monetized. That makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for answering that. Thank uh, you. Dr. Adi. All right. Uh, I'm going to take the next question from Mark. Uh, Mark has two questions. The first one is. What do you think about bootstrapping to raise capital to grow your business and maintain control? A second question is, do you think it is better to start a service-based business to lower the risk of failure? Reselling, for example, reselling products first as a consultant, and then after you build an audience, then you move into your own product-based business, asking for a friend, smile. Okay, sorry. Uh, let me. They're both good questions. Uh, sorry, what was the first question again? The, que the first question is about bootstrapping to raise capital to grow your business and maintain control. So, uh, so I would I would argue that maintaining control is very important. Um, when we raised angel money, we sold forty five percent of the business, so the founders had fifty five percent. You know. Uh, I think it's a good idea to maintain control. Uh, I would say only give up control when you can sell some shares. So when we sold to private equity, the advice I got was 
make sure you can sell enough. So if it doesn't work out with the institutional investors, you got money in the bank, right? So I would say maintaining control is a good idea. Um, you know, until you get to a point where you can take some liquidity, you can take some risk off the table yourself. Um, the other, the other question is a really good one. That's how a lot of companies do bootstrap. They start off reselling other products or doing, you know, development services, you know, code writing code, or this is how Firmex started. Firmex is actually a carve out of a development shop of 11 developers. Um, and the first project was the knowledge management. And, and I, I was working somewhere else, but I was a really good, they needed me because they wanted me because I was a really good salesman, right? And they knew me because I'd beaten them on a lot of deals. So. And so I didn't like that. They wanted to commercialize that custom services product for this law firm. And I didn't like it. They had, and then another one came up when I joined them. And they said, this is, this technology is not as interesting. It's really simple, but we did this for this customer too. And then when I looked at the market for deal room, this is 2005 when I wrote the business plan. I said, I think we got something here. I think I can sell a lot of this deal room software. And I, we're going to have a different commercial model than the competitors. We're going to go digital marketing, inside sales. Like I had a whole different operating model, right? And I've learned this through my experience of working in other companies, right? And so um, it's very common. It's actually the most capital efficient way to start out doing services and then move into a product. Awesome, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So the next question is from uh, NASA. He has two questions. The first one is about business model. He asked uh, what your thoughts are about the freemium model, like going, starting with the freemium biz business model. And then the second one is uh, that since Femex has 50% uh, market, mark, like 50% of your markets in the US, like what's the, how do you break into that as a company that is based out of the US. Well, how do we how do we get into other countries outside of yeah. Canada? Or? Yeah. Okay. So, so freemium. Look, there's been a lot of successful businesses that have a freemium model. They tend to be smaller. You know, they tend to be. I mean, Dropbox has a freemium model. But remember, freemium is not free to you. It's free to them. So you still got to host all that data. Um, it can be quite, it, depending on the nature of the data you're hosting, if it's documents, um, they can be, you know, that can be a lot of bandwidth, up and down um, bandwidth. Like Dropbox at one point, I haven't checked recently, the public had only 60% gross margins versus 92%. So, and Dropbox took a billion dollars in capital. So, um, now there are a lot of freemium apps out there. I, I know it's one for like managing stock portfolios, right? That seems to be quite successful. You know, um, you really have to understand your cost to giving free software as part of your model. But, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of them have been, been very successful, especially smaller applications um, and so forth. So on. We, we don't do it in our business. It, it's, it's not, um, it doesn't work. It's a very intense process and people tend to be risk averse and they want to, um, we've tried it actually. <laughs> It doesn't doesn't have pull, but in some other uh, categories it does. But just be wary of what it costs you. Now, as far as going outside uh, exporting, so we are seventy percent export. Um, you know, we really found what's really remarkable, and I was selling technology before the internet, <laughs> and boy, what a difference! Um, you can pretty much sell to anywhere in the world. They're, they're not. There's no discrimination as to um, you know, people want to buy software, they're pretty comfortable buying it uh, pretty much, especially from Canadians Some Canadians are considered very uh, good people. I want to add, by the way, this is a fabulous environment to start a tech company. Toronto is one of the largest tech hubs in North America. It's also, we don't live in a corrupt society. We don't have to pay people off. Like I'm sure a lot of people are aware that most countries in the world are corrupt where business entrepreneurs are blackmailed and so forth and so on. You know, we have a tremendous, we have a very supportive government. We have like these things called shred credits and so forth and so on and grants and all sorts of things. So um, great place to start a, a business from, great place to export to other countries. Um, the other big advantage of Canada is actually our costs are lower here because we're not paying US dollars to uh, operate. We're Canadian dollars, which is the US dollars a premium right now. So, um, and, and just really good um, 
and flexible labor laws and, and all sorts of things that could go on and on. But it's a great, I mean, you are in the right place to start a tech company. Thank you very much. The next question is from Angela. She's asking, how do you find angel investors to invest in your startup uh, for you that did did that happen to you due to your pre previous sales experience or connections? Oh, great question. Uh, the best advice I got, so, you know, I happen to have a cousin who worked in the deal world. And the advice I got actually raising money is if you go to raise money for something, you need to go to people who understand what you're doing, understand the domain, right? And so we we're in the deal room and this fund that my cousin worked at had actually used the product when we built it as a custom product for a law firm to just raise $2 billion. So they had affinity with what I was doing. And so he then, you know, at the T, this is TD Capital. These are, but this was personal checks for, you know, people at TD Capital, which is TD Bank. Um, they were the primary initial fund, but look, it wouldn't have sold if there wasn't ringing the sales bell, I call it the sales bell. So every time we sell a customer, an email goes out with a number. I think we're on sales bell almost 5,900. Right now. <laughs> um, and so I was, I was quickly monetizing that. But yes, you know the neat thing about angels, you get one lead angel and he'll bring in, he or she will bring in four friends. And so I actually raised money from 30 angels, but really I raised money from seven and they brought their friends. So, um, um, but yeah, you want to find high net worth people who understand your space, but you also like, I, they wouldn't have given me a, a nickel if I hadn't been already, I had a product out on the market and selling customers. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. So Ibrahim asks, uh, what do you think about two sided businesses, consumer business? And, uh, I, I imagine a B2B, so a business that has two sides two sides, how would you approach uh, that kind of business? Oh, uh, consumer business versus business to business? Yeah, so uh, a business that supports both both consumers, the build for consumers, and then they have some customers that are also businesses. A combination well, of- uh, Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I mean, I look, um, I, I, can, I can tell you this, BDC is really hard to do. It's just really hard to do. We don't in, in the ace in the pure scale community of a hundred companies. I think we have one that came in and out. It's actually very successful. It's called prodigy. They did. Um, if you've got any kids, it's a, it's math games for, for eight and nine year olds called prodigy and they bootstrap. This company is on fire. Uh, they, 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 uh, I don't know what revenue is at now. It's like 50 million in revenue with not a nickel of funding. And they're local here in Toronto, a couple of engineer, engineers out of University of Waterloo. Uh, that's the only B2C business that I know has been successful out of like uh, many. Um, it's just really, really tough um, is, is, as far as I understand to, to scale B2C without a lot of capital. And that involves a lot of risk. Oh, look, my kids play Prodigy. <laughs> there you go, I thought. <laughs> and so... Um, you know, so I, I, I don't know about a blend, um, you know, again, if, if people are buying the stuff online, uh, usually, you know, consumer businesses are self-serve for the most part, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a different game and it's not one I'm really familiar with because I've never built a B2C business. Um, B2B is you're just much more insulated because you can really focus on something unusual. The other problem with B2C is everyone thinks about B2C businesses because everyone's a consumer. Right. And so they look at, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I had this app on my phone? Um, with B2B, you have to know something unusual about a business process. Like you have to say, you know, I know a lot about municipal licensing workflow, right, for towns and cities. And it's like, you know, all the, you know, university kids coming out of school, but no one really knows about that workflow. That's important. <laughs> right. Um, you know, one of the advantages of working for a little bit before you start a company is understanding of industry domain and understanding something that's really niche. And so it's just, it's just your, your probability of success is a lot higher. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing okay. that. 
that this is the uh, somebody's question was just answered because uh, Cameron was asking that what would you recommend to an 18 year old looking into entrepreneurship within the technology space and yeah actually no it's a good question I, I we get a lot of our entry level staff I interview a lot of the entry level sales people because my strength is sales and finance and um, a lot of them are recent university grads and I said look in your career you're really in the business world you, you're gonna have two choices and they're totally different universes there's the entrepreneurial world and the corporate world and they're just very different you can be successful in both the different skill sets too to be successful in the corporate world you're going to need um, you know, to, there's going to be internal politics and there's all sorts of internal, you know, other types of, I was never good at that. I was horrible at it. I was a disaster. Um, in the, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, I think the best thing is to work in some entrepreneurial businesses to start, because then you're going to see how things are done. You're going to see a lot more than you would in a big company. Cause you're going to see, you're going to see the marketing department. You're going to see the sales, the engineering, you're going to see all sorts of things. And that'll give you a real base. Uh, I worked in really small companies, like six, seven, 10, 20 people. So it was easy for me to start a business. Um, and so I tell young people, you know, you're 18, you know, when you get into the work world, you know, it would be helpful if you worked in small companies, if your plan is to start a, a business. Thank you, Joel. This is the last question and I'm the one asking, sure. what is the amount of equity that you would suggest to give out? Because you talked about uh, be ready to delegate tasks, be ready to e expand. So as you expand, let's say you started the business with two co-founders and you are expanding, wanting to hire a CMO for better marketing and all these people. What is the right amount of equity to, to say, this is what I want to give out to people that will be hired? Right now. Okay. So the, the first assumption is that you're paying the market. Are you paying them a market salary? So, you know, CMO comes along and they're getting paid, you know, whatever it is, 200,000 a year. If you're pilling, pilling them full market, that's an, one answer. And if you're not, it's another, another answer. No, no, if you're not paying them full market, you're just developing it and you are hoping to get them to put work into it for you, but with no mar full market price payment. Yeah. I, I don't have a great answer to that, Eddie, you know, like, because I, I haven't done it, um, but um, uh, you know, that's somewhat discretionary. I mean, usually you have co-founders and you each, you know, you take a piece and I, I, I was given, I came in, I didn't, I came in a little later. I had a, 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 a pretty good piece, but, it, but, um, like I, I, I actually am an example of that. So I got paid half of what I was my market salary when I joined Firmex and I got 20%. Okay. Now there was no business yet. There was no sales, right? And uh, I, then I would, ended up taking over as the CEO of the company because they only need to raise the money. Typically speaking, a company, once it gets established, has an op stock option plan. They're relatively easy to create. Um, they could typically, in an early stage company, they'd be for 15 to 20% of the stock would go to the stock option you, uh, plan, plan. And those stock options would vest over four or five years, for example. So they'd have to be working for that time. Um, it's pretty common for executives to get, you know, you know, two uh, percent, something like that, of that fifteen percent. Um, but you know, you're paying them pretty close to market, right? And then you would then, you know, it's, you know, venture capital say five percent to a, a new CEO if the other one's been fired, five percent to the CEO, five percent to the executive team, five percent for everyone else, right? That that's and that's a more established business. Um, but um, you know, stock, stock options is actually a constant in, in private equity too. They tend to be when you get bigger, the plans tend to be ten percent, but the company's worth a lot more, right? So, um, but you know, that's that's more of a kind of you know, it depends how much they're working. Like they brought me on full time for half salary, and they gave me twenty percent. Mm, thank you. Right. But, yeah. uh, thank you for being with us today, Joel. Thank you for sharing with us. I actually have one of um, one of our audience, Matt and Matt who also grew up, who was born in Jen and Finch. So yeah. he was very excited to be here and, 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 and hearing from you and knowing fully well what is possible for him as well. I uh, thank you for your support of the work we do at, at uh, STEM Hub uh, with your employees, with your resources and being here with you, having access to you is one of our biggest blessings because 
we, we know uh, how much that means. Uh, usually this is uh, this is a, a, an opportunity where you, you, you share and you get paid for it. We are not paying you anything and yet you have given so much to us today. We appreciate all the work you do for us as people uh, and the black community are indebted to people like you. It is my hope that uh, other uh, founders will see your example and do more for the community, not just the black community, but do more for the community where they actually grow their business. We're very thankful for your contributions and we hope to continue to work with Fremex and definitely at some point, hopefully I get to meet you in person. Uchi and sure. last. Well, thank you, Adiel, for sure. I have a large community, so I have lots of people that would be more than willing to um, help. Um, I've been doing this for free for many organizations, by the way. That's like this is something that, to me, I I, I want to see other people succeed. Um, you know, and so uh, I've been giving free talks, and I'm more than happy to do it. It's a uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure to go ahead and do this. So. Uh, you know, by all means, and uh, you know, feel free to share my uh, my slides and um, the, the survey. And if there's other topics uh, down the road you want to cover off, because there's a lot to talk about, <laughs> um, I'm happy to help. Thank you, Uchi. Right. Any to your side? Uh, no, I just wanted to say that thank you uh, so much for making our time for this. It's a privilege for us. Uh, everyone, it's been um, almost over mm. 20 weeks of relationship building, skill acquisition, question and answer, hands-on training, and so much more. Thank you all for joining us every week. Thank you for learning from uh, different presenters. And we hope that everything that we have learned together are skill sets that will help you in your career. We hope that you'll be here with us next year when we start the series, two, series three. Please follow us on all social media platforms. A whole lot of our work has been streamed to YouTube. You can watch videos from our previous series there for you to continue to skill up. As we end today, it is our hope that you'll continue to reflect on technology, Industry 4.0, and what is possible. Thank you again, Joel, for being here with us. This is the end of our Tech Masterclass Series 2, and um, this is goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye.